Hello, this is Corinne Wetmore with ROTW News. I'd like to welcome you to the first in a three-part series entitled Living with Faults. In it, we'll explore the risks and responsibilities of living so close to two of California's longest faults, namely the San Jacinto and San Andreas. Unlike other programs you've seen on this topic, this series will focus specifically on the region between Wrightwood and Big Bear Lake and the valleys below. You ready to get started? Then let's go. Every time you drive up Highway 18, 330 or 38, you cross the San Andreas Fault. Descending through Cajon Pass, the fault hugs the base of the San Bernardino Mountains, marking the boundary of the Pacific and North American plates. Although the San Bernardino segment has been locked at the surface for more than 300 years, miles below, the two plates continue to creep past one another, bending the Earth's crust and building up tension that can only be released through a sudden shift, which we experience as an earthquake. Just how fast the plates are shifting and how much strain is building up on the locked fault is the focus of research conducted by Dr. Sally McGill of Cal State San Bernardino. So we've been studying the San Andreas and San Jacinto faults uh, in the San Bernardino area. Uh, both of those faults are long faults. The San Andreas goes all the way from the Salton Sea in Southern California up through San Francisco and off the coast of Northern California. We're just studying the uh, kind of a portion of the southern section of that fault that where it heads through San Bernardino and Highland and Yucaipa in that area. And then as well the San Jacinto Fault, the portion of that that is parallel to uh, or that runs through the San Bernardino Valley area. Uh, basically from about Moreno Valley uh, up through San Bernardino to Lytle Creek. That's the section of San Jacinto Fault that we're studying. And what we're finding is that those two faults together um, are slipping somewhere between 15 and 26 millimeters per year and the GPS data don't really allow us to distinguish how much of that 15 to 26 is apportioned to the San Andreas versus the San Jacinto Fault. Uh, we're not really able to resolve that but those two combined are moving somewhere between 15 and 26 millimeters per year and that represents um, maybe a, a third to one half of the total motion across the, the plate boundary between the North American and Pacific plates. Since 2002, McGill and her intern teams have been studying fault movements in the San Bernardino Mountain and Valley region, using global positioning system tools on several dozen sites adjacent to the San Andreas and San Jacinto faults. They measure earth movement outside the locked zone to determine the probability and size of a potential earthquake. So we're using uh, like U.S. Geological Survey benchmarks, the little brass discs that you might have seen cemented into a rock when you're hiking. And we go back to those year after year and we set up the GPS equipment and we can measure how fast is that particular point on the ground moving. It's moving, it's every point on the earth is on one tectonic plate or another and they're all moving all the time. And we're trying to measure how fast are the points on the Pacific plate moving relative to the points on the North American plate. Envision four survey marks, two on each side of a fault. As the plates on each side move, the distance and angle between the survey marks change. Lines A, B, and C, D will stay about the same because they're on the same side of the fault. Lines A, C, A, D, and B, D, however, will get longer, and line B, C will get shorter as the earth bends in response to plate movement along the locked fault. The change in line length divided by the total line length is the computed fault strain or stress. So the faster the stations are moving relative to each other, or the faster this bending is happening across the plate boundary, then the faster the stress is building up on the fault. So the faster the measurements that we measure, the more likely we are to have earthquakes, or the longer we wait, the more likely those earthquakes are to be large. Getting accurate data requires precise setup of the GPS equipment, as geology intern Brian Anderson explains. All right, first we have this tripod here set up, <clears throat> just a normal surveying tripod. We set it up um, approximately over where we're going to be surveying, the surveying benchmark. And then the, the next thing that we're going to do here is, is put on the tribrack. All right, so right here we have the tribrack set up on top of this tripod here. And the, the main objective is to try and get this this bubble here, this, this level, uh, perfectly leveled and get that little bubble in the center there so that ultimately when we put the antenna on top, it, it is perfectly level and we know the exact position of, of 
where it is. All right, so the next step we're doing here is putting on this antenna. Now, how this antenna is aligned is, is also important in getting, you know, completely precise and accurate, ac accurate data. What Jamie's doing is she's aligning it with, tr with True North. So yeah. through the years as we do this, we can get the exact same um, position. All right, so the next step that we've, we've done is we've connected, you know, the, uh, the antenna cable and connected it down to this receiver as well as hooked it up to a battery so that it can, it can be taken out into remote locations. But the, what John is doing here with the receiver is you program in the, the exact site name so that uh, just for, for organization we know that this receiver has been collecting you know, data for this exact site. And then <clears throat> we just leave it and, and allow it to collect data over, over the days or however long we need it. With nearly eight years of data collected, McGill shares her insights about the potential for a quake in the San Bernardino region. So the GPS velocities that we're measuring are consistent with uh, what's been measured before and with the recent probability estimates that have been published by the U.S. Geological Survey and the Southern California Earthquake Center. Uh, and what those show is that within the next 30 years, we have about a 59% chance of a magnitude 6.7 or larger earthquake on the San Andreas Fault. Most likely it would be larger than 6.7. Uh, and on the San Jacinto Fault, about a 31% chance within the next 30 years. And if we consider, you know, not just those two faults, but, you know, all the faults in Southern California, um, we have about a 97% chance that in the next 30 years we're going to have a magnitude 6.7 or larger earthquake. That's the size of the Northridge earthquake. So, you know, almost a virtual certainty that sometime in the next 30 years we're going to have another Northridge-sized earthquake or larger. Um, if you move up to the magnitude 7 range, there's a 82% chance that we might have an earthquake that large or a 37% chance of a magnitude 7.5. Um, it is possible we could have a magnitude 8 earthquake, but probably only about a 3% chance of that in the next 30 years. Findings released in August by researchers at UC Irvine and Arizona State suggest the risk of a large quake on the San Andreas may be even higher because strong earthquakes on the fault were found to have happened more frequently than previously thought. With that possibility in mind, watch for part two of Living with Faults, where we'll discover what you can expect to experience in the San Bernardino Mountains should a large quake strike on the San Andreas or San Jacinto Fault. This is Corinne Wetmore reporting for ROTW News.